Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Team House. Uh, this is episode 159. I am Dave Park, my co-host Jack Murphy. Uh, tonight, we have a great guest with us, uh, Bill Walter, who has written uh, two books about the AC-130 uh, and its service, you know, in, in, our, in our history. Uh, he's also a former AC-130 gunner. Um, and, Bill, you, are, you were... Uh, put into the SOCOM Commando Hall of Honor and also the Air Commando Hall of Fame. So I guess you know a little bit about the AC-130 and flying <laughs> operations. I guess, that's, I guess that's safe to say. <laughs> that's awesome. So one of the things that we always like to start out with on this show is what is your origin story? How did you, what led you to the military? What led you to AC-130s? All right. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up in a small town in Minnesota. It's a farming town. Uh, I, I can't even imagine what the population, around 1,000, 1,200 or so population. Really small town out there. And there wasn't, uh, it was the 70s, the mid 70s, 76, as a matter of fact. Post Vietnam, it had been over for about a year by that time. It wasn't really a popular uh, choice going into military. But uh, there was a high school counselor we had there named Mr. Erickson that uh, was really a patriotic sort of fella. And he says, hey, guys, uh, don't discount going into military. You can get an education. You can serve your country. And uh, think about it. So four of us did uh, join the Air Force, all four of us. And uh, I was the only one that stuck with it. But uh, it's, uh, that's how I started out. Two weeks after I graduated from high school, I was at Blackland Air Force Base uh, in basic training. Really? What Were your parents supportive of that? Were they, uh, I mean, what did they think about it? Uh, yeah, my dad was a uh, former Navy. Uh, he served in the CVs uh, back in, uh, in the 50s, and uh, he was very supportive. A lot of people were supportive, but I, I, I could say there were some people that questioned my judgment. Uh, from my high school class and from, uh, from, well, I'll put it this way. There was this uh, girl on the bus. My dad was a school bus driver and uh, I was riding on a route with him because I had nothing else to do at the time. And my dad says, Hey, Bill's going in the, uh, in the air force next week. And she looked at me like, well, like she just smelled a fart or something. <laughs> and what, what are, what is on your mind? What are you doing this for? I said, well, that's, what I want to do, and uh, I tell you, it's probably the best decision I ever made. And how, how did you end up with AC-130s? Well, I, I went in uh, my first uh, first assignment. I went to technical training for weapons loading, uh, and I got assigned to Hahn Air Base, Germany, loading bombs on F-4s. And that included everything from uh, cluster bombs uh, up to uh, nukes. We had nukes there, too. And I can tell you, uh, I have a lot of respect for our maintenance people because I was one myself and they work their ass off, let me tell you. Uh, and that's what I did for two years. I stuffed bombs on F4s and loaded the guns. And I got this notification just before I was getting ready to go uh, PCS, permanent change of station back to the States. I got uh, a notification saying, hey, they're looking for volunteers to go fly on the AC-130 gunship. And I had already known some about the AC-130, but I didn't know that much. And I said, that sounds like a really cool job. Let me let me volunteer for that. So I did. I volunteered for it. And uh, about this time, uh, 44 years ago, I got the notification that don't go to KISR or Michigan, where you're supposed to go. Go to Florida to uh, go for AC-130 gunner training. And, and that's what I showed up just around Thanksgiving time in 1978. Now, you've written two books. Uh, they are, uh, sorry, I don't have them right in front of me. And I read, so I read your book on, on Kindle because that's how I read a ton of stuff. Yeah, can you please show the book? Yes. So, uh, this is the first one. This is the second one. Right. So Ghost Riders, uh, the first one is Ghost Riders uh, and it covers Vietnam, the AC in Vietnam. Yes, uh, 1968. 
through 19, I'm trying to figure this thing out here. Yeah, right. Uh, 1975. Right. And the second one uh, is 1976 through 1995. Right. Um, and I want to ask you about your career, and we also want to talk about the books, but I know for the second book, you flew in almost every one of those operations that are in the second book, even though it's not written in a biographical way. Uh, right. Uh, I, I actually, yeah, I did. I was involved in every one of those operations. But uh, like I tell people, this is a we book. It's not a me book. I made a probably deliberate effort to write myself out of some of the stories because I, I just felt it was kind of self-serving to do so. Uh, you know, gunship crews are teams. That's all we ever do is we work as a team. And uh, we're only, you know, it sounds kind of cliche. You're only as good as your weakest uh, member of the team. You guys, Rangers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I tell you, I thought because of that, because I was involved in all those ops in one way or another, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy for me to write because, hey, I, I know it all. Um, that was probably wishful thinking because I found out as I started doing the research and interviews over a seven-year process, by the way, uh, I found out just how much I didn't know. Maybe, maybe I knew 20% of what was really pertinent. Uh, maybe I knew some stuff that was factual, and I knew a whole lot of stuff that was hearsay, rumor, uh, just incorrect all the way. And it was quite a process to validate all these stories because I had to use, once I got going, I said, I need three different independent sources minimum and independent meaning I will coordinate either interview or official records, which I had access to all the official records. Uh, it only goes so far. So I had to, uh, as many original or witness statements or data sources that I could to validate a specific story. And that was, uh, that's why it took so long to write. Well, I read the second book and it has something that will appeal to everybody because you go over the technical specifications of the gunships and how they evolved. Uh, for the operations, you talk about the history of that area to give people a, a ground understanding of what was going on in that area and how the U.S. got involved. You covered the planning of it uh, and then the actual operation and not just the AC-130 operation, but every, what, everything that was going on and then how the AC-130s fit into that. It was, it's a phenomenal book. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, you know, and that's what, uh, as you know, you guys are soft guys, too. We never do anything alone, and that's why I said I, I just can't write a book just about the AC-130s because we always support someone else. I can tell you rarely do we ever go out and do a mission that just like a uh, interdiction mission and shoot something up. We're almost always supporting uh, Rangers, SF, uh, D-Boys, and, you know, I still say that, D-Boys. Uh, I mean, it's just ingrained in my brain uh, and, uh, and the SEALs. So, I mean, that's that's what our job is. And, and I, I'd say we take it very seriously, and I think we all do. So that's uh, just kind of the the way of life for a gunship uh, crew. I say crewmen, but actually back when I flew, we only had uh, male uh, crewmen. Now we have both female and male, and uh, they're doing phenomenal downrange now, even today. Right. So tell us a little bit, because again, your story is really the story in this book. So let's talk about you um, and sort of how that, how the training went, how you were introduced to the AC-130. Actually, if you don't mind, let me run that. Can you tell everybody about the AC-130 for those of our viewers who might not be military, what it is, what its mission is, and how it came about in the first place? Uh, certainly, yes. Uh, you know, if we step back all the way back to the early 60s uh, with the AC-47, they had a, a dilemma in Vietnam. What they needed was airplane or a, a strike system that could stay airborne for extended periods of, uh, of, uh, of flight time, uh, mostly at night, and that had sufficient firepower to deal with the North Vietnamese infiltrators who liked to operate at night. So the AC-47 came about, and they had uh, about eight hours of loiter time, depending on what their fuel load and ammo load was, and about 23,000 rounds of 7.62 and three miniguns. 
and they actually could stay overhead a friendly encampment uh, uh, for the entire period of darkness or pretty close to it and provide cover fire for them. It was, it was really no, nothing else could do that. The only way you could reach that capability is to actually modify a cargo airplane that had both the, the legs, as we call it, and the uh, ability to carry the weight for all that firepower and have the ability to uh, see at night. Uh, first, they used flares. Uh, then uh, the AC-130 came along in 1967. It was developed, 68, it hit the trail. Now, uh, much bigger airplane, higher altitude, heavier armament, and mostly hunting trucks on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, they still did do some of the support for, uh, for ground forces, but uh, mostly hunting trucks in the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And, and you'll see that in the first book that they were scored uh, in about a five-year period, 10,000 North Vietnamese trucks are credited with killing. Didn't close down a trail, uh, but it sure slowed it down. And we could talk about that all night. It's really not my intent to do so. But uh, very interesting history on that. Now, what kind of crazy people would take a cargo airplane, put a bunch of guns and sensors on it, and call that a attack system? Ah, we did. Because it worked. It doesn't matter what it is. It's what it does. And that is kind of our, uh, I won't say our saying, but that's, that's really kind of what the tenet of the gunship is. Uh, it is able to stay airborne for long periods of time, heavy firepower, lots of it, and has the sensors to see in the dark and target in the dark with precision. So it's really what the gunship's all about. It's just, other than that, it's just a regular C-130, and it acts like a C-130, uh, but it's uh, an attack C-130. And it was interesting because, and this is a fact I didn't know, is even with the success of the AC-130, in around 1975-76, it was, they planned on scrapping it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was uh, one of the things that came out, and this is not uh, our first rodeo with that kind of action, because uh, they, uh, you know, whenever people want to build up the forces and react to the threat at hand, well, post-Vietnam, uh, 75 Vietnam was all over. And actually, the gunship start sh stopped shooting in 73 uh, when they had all the, the different ceasefires. So uh, they stayed over there until uh, late 75 and came back to the States. The saying, and we're hearing it now, today, well, we're never going to fight another war like that ever. So let's get rid of the gunships because they're really kind of ad hoc and they're kind of kind of nobody really likes them in the fighter world, which is true. I mean, they have, they have no love for the gunship. It's not a jet. It's just a, <laughs> that's right. You know, it's just, it's uh, uh, in, you know, back in Vietnam, our gunship uh, crewman called it the four engine fighter just to piss off the fighter guys. <laughs> now, I, I'd say they, they got along pretty good with the fighter guys over there because uh, they uh, support, and by and large, uh, we get along okay with them, but it's just, two different worlds. And uh, so, yeah, when I got, when I signed on to Hurlbert in 78, I went to the, uh, uh, the base personnel office to sign in and they said, don't plan on staying here long because the gunships are going away. They're going to be retired. And this base is closing. This is Hurlbert field. Well, uh, yeah, you know, what happened in November 4th, 1970 or 79 changed all that. And we're still here uh, 44 years later. So what happened in 1979 is fascinating, uh, and it saved the AC-130. Yes, and not just the AC-130, pretty much all the special operations elements, because back then there was only uh, uh, two Ranger, uh, Ranger bats, and you know they didn't bring up the third until after Grenada. But uh, pretty much everybody was on the chopping block back then because... The focus by the Joint Chiefs was the war against Russia, the Cold War. They really didn't give much of a hoot about what was going on in the third world. The things that we are accustomed to dealing with, they, they had really no, uh, no desire to continue that capability. They didn't think it was important. Uh, well, uh, not until the Iranian hostage situation happened when they were taken hostage on the 4th of July, 79. 
And we, the U.S., had absolutely no capability to go rescue those hostages. And that's kind of where it all started with the modern special operations and what came out of that mission. So can you tell us both from a personal level, like what was going on with you at the time? And then we can go into the history of, of Rice Bowl and, and, uh, and everything. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of like what, what people were calling prior to that, the Herbert Field Flying Club, because it really was flying around the flagpole, going shooting on the local ranges. It was really kind of a, kind of a sleepy place, I guess, because we didn't, we're going TDY to training exercise and stuff. It wasn't, everybody was kind of getting ready to be canceled. Yeah, I guess that's a good way of putting it. So uh, here comes the news. Everybody's watching the news. And within uh, a day or so, we were alerted. Of course, you know, you think everybody's alerted for that. And Herbert was a little bit different. Uh, so they called us and they said, all right, uh, you guys are deploying to Guam. Really? Guam? Wow. Why are we going to Guam? Shut up and do it. And I can tell you, uh, I didn't find out some of this stuff that really happened for more than 30 years. That's how classified the operation was and how close old it was. Uh, General Vaught was in charge of the overall operation, uh, Army, two-star at the time, and he was old school SF. I mean, he was locking down everything. He says, only share information with those who absolutely need to do it. Well, that doesn't include uh, a three-stripe airman <laughs> or whatever, like I was at the time. Okay. All right. So shut up in color. Don't talk because if you start talking or speculating, we're taking you off the mission and you're, you're going home. Well, everybody wanted to be on whatever was happening. And we didn't really know what it was, but Hey, I want to be a part of it. So uh, here it is years later. I find out that uh, when we deployed about the 10th of November, I think, or it was 10 days afterwards, I think, after the hostages were taken, we deployed to Guam and we we're doing all these wacky training things that we'd never done before, low level infiltration, firing at uh, uh, on a pop up. And I tell you, nobody should use the word pop when they're talking about a C-130 because it just kind of slowly drags up, especially in a heavy gunship, uh, about a hundred and uh, 130,000 pounds light. And so we, uh, we did that training for a while. Well, what we were training for, and I didn't know, we were training to actually fire on the cracking towers, the petroleum processing plant at Abadan in, uh, in Iran. That was their main source of income. They said, we want you guys to shut down their petroleum production. It'll affect their, uh, their monetary income. And, well, whoever was on that targeting cell must not have really understood what our ordinance does. Because I tell you, if we would have hit those cracking towers, it would have been a fourth of July. The whole plant would have been destroyed. Uh, I, I'd say that with a high degree of confidence. So we came back, and uh, here the next thing within, oh, I think maybe a week, the mission, that mission was scrubbed, and we got put on another mission, again, that we didn't know about, but they said, I want you to go out to Range 52 here on Eglin and build this wall, this dimension, this this wide, this high, and uh, we're going to have the gunship shoot over that wall and practice and see what they could do. So I went out there, and uh, Bill Patterson, who has recently passed away, one of our old IOs, we went out there uh, with a bunch of other guys and built this wall, and we're like, what are we doing here? Okay, well, gunship came up there practice, shot over the wall, um, didn't hit it very many times. It, the wall was actually just two by fours and target cloth and uh, just to, to put up a barrier. And uh, they did manage to splash those projectiles into uh, the, uh, it was a hardened shelter out there with an F-100 fighter in there, just shredded it. Says, okay, we can do it. Okay, good. Went back and reported to General Vaught, uh, and that time, uh, Colonel uh, Jim Kyle came on board. And Jim Kyle was one of our operations officers over in Vietnam. Real smart guy. He knew all about gunships. And uh, there was a, a dilemma because what at the time, 
the uh, the D boys were practicing for the actual rescue. We weren't part of that plan. So uh, Colonel Beckwith, uh, he's like, hey, what are we going to do for air cover? Well, we got the carrier Nivets out there, but they got really, they've got this giant ordnance on there. They don't have a whole lot of legs. How are we going to target people or targets within a city at night and then have the ability to stay there long enough to affect anything? So uh, Jim Kyle just looks up and says, well, he says to General Vaught, why don't you bring in the AC-130? And Vaught was somewhat familiar with that. And he says, okay, uh, I'll brief the chairman, but only the people that need to know. And that's where we got tied in on the rescue. So continued training. And here it is. Uh, it's, it's early April in 1980 already. And uh, I just coming into work like normal duty day. And Steve Foster is there, who was the, uh, the second in command of the gunner section. And he pulls over and says, Walter, get in here. And he took us in there in a re uh, briefing room one at a time. He says, go home, pack a bag for warm weather for two weeks, shut the F up, don't say anything, don't tell anybody you're leaving, and just come in tomorrow morning at this time. Okay, well, I was single then. It didn't matter. Left some rent money on the bed for my room dogs <laughs> and took off. So uh, nobody even knew I was gone, and that's what they wanted. So we get, we get over there in theater, and uh, we finally got briefed on what we're going to do, and we met the D-Boys, and we met up with uh, uh, Colonel Bur Burris, who was our uh, fires guy, and uh, he, uh, he's told me, he says, hey, uh, he's the Vietnam vernacular, or the abbreviation, he says, I was a forward air guide, and I started spelling that out in the book, uh, F-A-G, and I said, you know, sir, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, <laughs> and he says, oh, you know, I never really thought of that. Uh, so I said, if you don't mind, every time I use your reference, I'll spell it out, uh, forward air guide. He goes, okay, good idea, Bill. <laughs> so anyway, it was really wild because this is the first time we met the D-Boys. And they were in a hangar not too far from us. Uh, 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 Hard Rock Charlie was right next door to us uh, from uh, – um, from, uh, Savannah. And uh, we went over to the D-Boy hangar and here these guys are all in civilian clothes with long hair, uh, dyed black field jackets. They look like, like, well, like Beck was said, a bunch of really dangerous vagrants. That's kind of what it came across as. And they had a whole, uh, like two sheets of plywood kind of size model of downtown uh, Tehran and said, Here's this, and Bucky took us through all the different targets and so forth. Says, here's what you're going to do. Well, there was four gunships involved in that mission, and to this day, most people have no idea that uh, there were AC-130s involved in in, uh, in in what some people call Desert One. That was just a fuel stop in Eagle Claw. So uh, there was four. Uh, Pappy Gallagher was crew one. He was supporting the actual rescue at the embassy compound after the D-Boys broke or actually climbed over the walls with ladders. And uh, then we had uh, Colonel Cagle, or at that time captain. He was covering the airport at Maribod. And then uh, we had Bubber Youngblood covering the, uh, the extraction airfield, which is about 30 miles out. And that would have been the very first Ranger airfield seizure. Because the whole uh, Hard Rock Charlie was taking down that airfield and securing it so the helicopters could bring the hostages over to uh, from the soccer stadium out to the uh, to the extraction airfield. They're going on 141s. We're going to abandon the helicopters there, and we we're supposed to shoot the helicopters uh, before we left. So uh, the mission was very complicated. You know, uh, people talk about it now. Uh, in general, saying, well, there was only eight helicopters and six C-130s and about 120 D-boys on there and a handful of Rangers. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. There was well over a 1,000 people on that mission. And if you want to talk about some real tactical deception, I tell you, uh, General Vaught, very, very clever. Uh, most people that were involved in the mission prior to the briefing the day or two days before we we're going to launch, had no idea they were involved in the mission. 
I mean, how how much better security can you get than that? Yeah. Okay. There was people on Wadi Kina, which was our main operating base. We called Location Alpha. There was people there, uh, like mostly to support Red Horse and so forth, the people that were taking care of the base. They thought they were there for Exercise Flintlock 80, which was being run out of Germany. As a matter of fact, that was the cover story. And there was people that were flying in supplies out of uh, out of Germany, the 7th SOS. They're flying in our ammo. They're flying in all these supplies. And they just thought they were part of the exercise. They had no idea that they were actually supporting the rescue mission. Again, they didn't have the need to know, so it's a chance of a leak. And Vaught was so concerned about a leak, and, and i got to say he was right, because had there been a leak, it would have been all over with. So the element of surprise was so important to keep. So uh, then in, a, in the final act of cleverness, they also had uh, the first SOS running up and down the waterway next to the border of Iran, creating this pattern of life the same route that the rescue force would take going in there. So uh, it was very, very deceptive. And the day that the MC-130s and the EC-130s arrived from Herbert to land at Wadi Kina, about a couple hours prior to that, they sent the eighth, or the uh, uh, first S, or excuse me, the uh, seventh SOS guys back up to Germany. So they took off. And here a couple hours later, the landing or the uh, rescue force came in. And nobody had any idea that those were different airplanes. They all looked the same. So very, uh, very good operational security, in, in my opinion. And I, and, uh, I, I think later on now, um, many years later, some people will, will say that it was too much, that there was people that really need to know something that they did not have the access to. And that was, uh, that was a hurdle, uh, maybe not a cause for failure, but it was, it was definitely a, a hurdle to the whole operation. So uh, I don't know if you want to go into what was supposed to happen on night two. That's pretty much it. You know, uh, I, the, I would like to ask you, Bill, um, you know, in, if people are interested to hear the Delta perspective, we did a, an interview with Sergeant Major Mike Vining um, in an episode of, a couple of years ago now that people can go back and check out. Uh, and I'd actually, I'd like to ask you the same question I asked Mike. If they did not lose a couple helicopters coming into Desert One, um, you know, they, they at that point were below min force. They couldn't get all their uh, all their personnel to Desert Two. Had that not happened, are you confident? Do you think that you could have successfully executed the operation as you understood it? Uh, yeah, you know, that's a really good question, and I, I tell you, I've talked to Mike about it too uh, in in the past. We've talked a lot of the other D boys too, and. And it, it's a pure speculation, but I can say that had we made it to night two, that we had a pretty good chance of successfully pulling it off as long as the element of surprise was uh, maintained. And we had uh, Major Dick Meadows at that time, a, a GS-13, and Freddie, who just had a birthday the other day, by the way. Uh, they were they were the in, internal force there to take the vehicles. I think they had like 10 or 12 drivers uh, there that we're going to pick up the D boys at uh, at the hide site from the 53s and then transport them down the hide site and then pull the mission the next night. So uh, I think that if we wanted to assign a percentage to it in Bill's reasonable guess, I think we had about a 70 percent chance of pulling it off. I, I think that's reasonable. Mike, Mike was pretty confident, too, that if they could have gotten the operators to the target area, that they could have successfully executed the mission. Um, and maybe that's one of the big things that we've learned in, in special operations over the last, you know, what, 30, 40 years since then. Um, mm -hmm. the, it, it's, you know, you can have these like super badass operators that can blow down doors and kill everyone inside. But if we don't have the uh, transportation and we've talked to some 160th guys about this, if you don't have the, the strategic airlift, if you don't have the tactical uh, rotary wing aircraft, and your part, the AC-130, if you don't have the air support, then it doesn't really matter how great the operators are, right? Yeah, and you know, one of the more rewarding parts of actually doing the research and writing the book, like I say, I, I thought I knew it all when I started out. I said, this is going to be easy. It was very difficult. And when I, when I linked up with the Marine Corps helicopter uh, crewman, 
uh, I tell you, I learned a lot. And they, a couple of those guys, they said they learned a lot from, from my research as well. Uh, it's, it's all this level of communications and misunderstandings. I had a lot of um, really uh, hyphenated cuss word type conversations with some of the AARS guys, the, the rescue guys in the Air Force, uh, friends of mine. And they said, well, they should have used us and they should have done this. And it would, well, you know, should have, would have, could have doesn't get you anything. Once I started to explain why it was the way it was and why OPSEC needed to be uh, maintained, and that's why the uh, Navy helicopters were chosen. And I, I can tell you, in all the Marines I have talked to, you know, they, they come out on the, the bad end of the stick on that because of the two airplanes that, you know, they were down to six. Well, uh, they don't deserve that, in my opinion. I mean, none of those guys just gave up and just said, screw it. Uh, they all had good reasons. You know, I can tell you, Jim Kyle was not too kind to uh, Colonel Pittman, who was on the airplane that turned back and went to the carrier. But, you know, they had a reason for it, too. So, I mean, and I'm sure you guys have been there before when the blame, did, when something goes great, everybody wants the credit for it. When something goes bad, yeah. they're fo- pointing their finger at somebody else. The, bl- the blame so, throwers come out. And it's it's not it's not <laughs> just that uh, you had to worry about a leak. Uh, interesting thing, too, is um, I don't know if you came across this in your research. I mean, you guys had KGB, the Soviets, looking looking at you guys and watching. And that's another whole thing you have to contend with when you're when you're executing a mission like this. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we had to, when we're at Wadi Kina, we had to put uh, camo netting over our guns so they look like regular 130s. But, you know, I mean, Ray Charles could see that they were not regular <laughs> 130s. Right. Come on, guys. I mean, humps and bumps and sticky things. But, uh, but we weren't so worried about that because we could still camouflage it in with part of the exercise, uh, Flintlock 80. What they could not camouflage was uh, a bunch of uh, CH-47s or helicopters on the deck of the Nimitz that couldn't go below deck. I mean, that would be that would be a let the cat out of the bag right away because the Soviets were watching and they said, hey, there's a bunch of Army helicopters on top of the deck or Air Force helicopters on the Nimitz. Something's going on. So it, it made a lot more sense to use a mine-sweeping helicopter that would be uh, not – unusual on an aircraft carrier and uh, you know there's some maintenance issues that they have with the helicopters too but you know that's just part of uh, part of the overall plan but uh, another thing that i found out too is you know we had we had one air force helicopter pilot on the helicopter detachment uh Rakeup, at that time a captain uh, i think he volunteered for it uh there was navy pilots there was navy crewmen and there was marine crewmen People get the idea that they kicked all the Navy guys off and all the Marines took over. Not exactly true. I mean, there was there was representation. Uh, one thing that I've heard over and over and over again is that Ronald Reagan, or not Ronald Reagan, um, he's the president <laughs> later Carter. on. Yeah, President Carter, Jimmy Carter. The reason why they had the mixed bag was because uh, he wanted all the services to get their hand in the operation. I, I, I can say that I found no evidence of that. As a matter of fact, Jimmy Carter didn't even know about the, uh, the details of the plan until like a week before we launched. He knew we were working on something, but he had no real play in it. As a matter of fact, they were hiding it from him because he didn't want Cyrus Vance, who wanted no part of any military operation. Uh, Cyrus Vance actually resigned when he found out that the go-ahead was given. Yeah, you so, I'm sorry, but you mentioned you were talking about OPSEC and you you mentioned in your book how one of the reasons for the operational security was because of Vance, because he was so dead set against military action. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He he said dipl- diplomacy is the only answer that uh, and he like I say, he was so so P.O.'d when he found out that Carter gave the go ahead that he actually resigned in protest before the accident, by the way. He, he resigned, but it was to take effective after the mission was complete. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of infighting there. But uh, I can tell you what is true uh, is that President Carter, and uh, I can say this, I'm not a fan of President Carter, but it doesn't really matter. He really didn't play into the picture on that, that uh, 
he did not really get involved in it. Who really did involve, get involved was uh, all the Joint Chiefs, all the different service branch generals. They all wanted a piece of the pie, and they were all bickering with each other as to who was going to take control and who was going to do this and that. And uh, that's where it really was. And this is because we had no central control over special operations forces like we do now. So it was uh, a command and control was, uh, was not what it could have been. Uh, now, I will say that I, high marks for, for Beckwith. Uh, you know, he was, he was a leader. Now, uh, it, meeting Charlie Breck, Beckwith was a real treat, let me tell you. Uh, I, I think that guy's volume knob was stuck on 11 all the time. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's like his, his actually one of his granddaughters uh, was, uh, was one of our gunners on a UMOB. No kidding. Uh, and Paul, she's, Paul Howe's she's, daughter, right? Yeah. Paul's she daughter was yep. also on the show. Um, what year and a half ago? Yeah. Paul, Paul's a good guy. He yeah, really yeah. is. And Mary, Mary is too. She's, uh, she's out right now, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it goes back into what I said earlier. Uh, all us soft people are all inbred. Everybody knows everybody. <laughs> it's the same community all the time. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, Charlie was, uh, was the way way he was, and uh, you know you got to respect that. I think we owe a lot to him, but boy, I tell you, there was just no negotiating with that guy. You know, it, it's interesting because I've always known. You, you know, we've talked about it on the show before about how uh, Desert One and Eagle Claw affected uh, special operations like SOCOM, the one sixty, things like this, that. But you were the whole thing was innovative. You talked about when you guys were going to Guam for your training, first off, you're flying an AC-130s, which are not pressurized, so you have to fly at low altitude, like 10,000. They mm -hmm. had just had the, uh, the refuelers put on them, and mm -hmm. a lot, the pilots, some of the pilots didn't even know how to do aerial refueling, and the trainers were like, oh, we can teach them on the way. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, my pilot was, uh, I was actually a crew four guy, by the way, and uh, my pilot was a uh, captain then jim lawrence and uh he's the one that got hit with the lightning bolt on the way over there while he was on the tanker it's like i i tell you uh, you know oh don't worry about learning this stuff we'll teach you on the way over over the north atlantic we're gonna we're gonna teach you or you know over the pacific we're gonna teach you on the way how to refuel what happens if something happens when we're learning and we break <laughs> something well i guess you're just hosed so uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't think we could get away with some of that stuff uh, nowadays. As a matter of fact, the follow-on train-up after the uh, mission aborted, uh, called uh, Operation Honey Badger mm -hmm. or Exercise Honey Badger, depending on who you talk to, uh, we did a lot of things, and that's when TF-160 really kind of came to be. Actually, uh, 158th, uh, you know, turned into 160th after a while, but. Uh, these are some really gung ho guys. My God, I mean, uh, we we were out there out in uh, Western U.S. at uh, uh, somewhere at Dugway. We were at uh, this place called the uh, Oro Grande Range Camp and flying out of Condor and Army Airfield on Wismer White Sands Missile Range. And man, I, I tell you, some of that stuff, I, I'm just surprised we didn't lose more airplanes because there was no rules at all. Just make this stuff up as you go. And I remember one time we were flying this low-level route, and Don Boudreau was our sensor operator, and he's, he's since passed away too. But I'm standing in the booth watching, and we're on the nav leg, and there's this mountain in front of us. And he's looking forward with the IR. And he's looking at it, and he scans all the way up till he hits the fuselage, can't see the top of the mountain. And finally, he keys his mic, says, hey, nav, there's a mountain ahead of us. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Well, are we going to hit it? No, we're not. And we cleared it by a couple hundred feet. I'm like, wow, man, uh, we're really, this is a C-130. It's not made for this kind of action. But, uh, and the same thing with the helicopters. I mean, by that time, it was all Air Force helicopters and Army helicopters. They had completely taken the, uh, the Navy Marine uh, uh, detachment out of it. So uh, it was uh, it was a wild time, but you know what? And as part of that, in the top of all the wild ideas was credible sport. 
Now, uh, Project Credible Sport, I don't know if you've seen that video. It's up on YouTube, as a matter of fact, if you want to oh, look at it. I know what you're talking it's the, the, uh, the DC-130 with the, uh, I think it was like 20 rocket motors on it. Uh, missile motors, actually, ASRock motors, that they wanted to land in the soccer stadium there right next to the embassy, and they were rigging that airplane up. And they built three of them. Actually, one was a just a test model, and then two were flyers. And uh, they crashed one right out here on field one. I know exactly where it's buried. You know, like the old saying, where the bodies are buried? Yeah, I can take you to it. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, everybody survived, and uh, you know it's it's just one of those things. I mean, if somebody came up with that idea right now, they'd have a padded cell for yeah. them somewhere, I'm sure. And they're definitely a piss test. So uh, it's just uh, you know it was desperate times. Uh, but you know the problem was even though they didn't do or um, I wouldn't say perfect, they didn't they didn't really they did have some successful takeoffs and landings. I'll give it that. They just had that one that wasn't. And so they canceled that program. And, well, uh, we weren't going to be able to go back a second time anyway because uh, the the cat was out of the bag. They had taken all the hostages and moved. And I've, I've talked to a couple of them since then. They moved them to different prisons throughout Iran. So there was no way that we were going to go back and uh, and and get, get all of them in one night. It was just impossible. Mm -hmm. So... I also thought of an interesting tidbit was Carter wanting to for wanting the ACs to use uh, CS gas. Yes, that was uh, that was something that Bucky made a lot of uh, a lot of hay with, <laughs> and so did uh, so did our uh, operations officer uh, Pappy Gallagher saying, "Well, okay, we've got." Uh, and anybody that's familiar with uh, 105 Artie knows that you got about a 30 pound projectile. And uh, with these three CS canisters in there, the ca CS canisters maybe weigh five pounds tops. Well, you, it's like three CS grenades pretty much, a little bit bigger than that. But uh, yeah, you're going to have a lot of potential for ricochet and damage and everything else. But see, uh, President Carter didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bucky had worked it out, but it was a, it was a order from uh the uh from the president actually right to the d boys and so bucky had worked out a plan saying okay and he worked this out with uh pappy gallagher it says all right if i get in a pinch i'll throw one of the grenades out and then i want you to shoot a grenade with 40 millimeter <laughs> okay solve the problem right there so that was like uh, the, um, how can I say, the, the variable use of force. Mm -hmm. Okay, the grenade didn't work, so we had to go to the next step. And uh, we were uh, would have been firing Mish Metal, which is a zirconium liner inside of, or the early ones were actual Mish Metal, the same metal that's in uh, Ronson's cigarette lighter flint. And uh, when the projectile explodes, there's a ball of sparks, and you guys might have seen this downrange. It's about 30 feet high and about 30 feet around, and it just scares the bejesus out of everybody. And that was our objective. We didn't want to kill a bunch of uh, Iranians. Mm -hmm. We just wanted them to leave us alone. Mm -hmm. So the objective was suppressive fire, uh, what we call reason suppression, uh, where the rational mind says, okay, I'm staying away from that. And those closer to the impact, it's unreason suppression, where they're like panic, fear, things like that. So our, our objective was to keep the throbes or the, um, the, the, the people away from our rescuers and the hostages. That, that was the end result. That's fascinating. Want to uh, jump over to Grenada? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because yeah, we go uh, through 86. Uh, yeah, can we go into Urgent Fury then? Because you talk about a few of the other operations, uh, Build Kirk and Blue Flame. But if you don't mind, can we, can we kind of go to Grenada? Yeah. Certainly. I, I think that's a good choice because, uh, I mean, Grenada is uh, one of those operations that really took a, a bad hit publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and granted, uh, it did result in uh, eventually the formation of SOCOM, which we all know real well, that uh, Grenada was part our fault, part not our fault. Uh, it was mostly, I will give credit to all the, the snuffies in the field 
and the, the flyers and the Marines and the sailors for making that mission happen because it sure as hell wasn't happening from the command and control element. And a good friend of mine too, uh, General Patterson was the, uh, was the air boss for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the airlift forces. And we've talked a great deal about this. Uh, I mean, Grenada is such a wild ride for most people. And what people don't understand is why we went there. Why we went there to begin with was because there was a communist overthrow, a blood coup, mm-hmm. where, uh, where Bishop was assassinated by Cord, one of his cabinet members. All right. Well, we had uh, over a thousand medical students there and in uh, two campuses. At first, they didn't even know how many there was there. And so says, we got to get these people out of there because Cord had them on house arrest and lockdown on the campuses. And uh, one of the parts of doing my research in the book was I actually located uh, a medical professor that was there Mm -hmm. uh, named uh, Robert Jordan, Mm -hmm. great guy. And uh, one of the students that was there too, who's a doctor now too, Hank Collins. And I got their firsthand impression of, of what was going on. There it was really quite uh, uh, quite an eye opener. I'll put it that way. But uh, plus the fact that we only had about nine days of planning time and to execute the mission, and there was no intel worth a crap. Uh, nobody really is really caught the U.S. by surprise. So what are we going to do now? Well, now they had the the Navy Carrier Task Force the uh, Independence Carrier Group that was diverted. They were on their way to Beirut. They diverted them down there to Grenada and said, you're going to do this NEO, uh, non-combat and evacuation operation for the civilians that are not familiar with our <laughs> acronyms. Anyway, uh, it was way too big of an operation for the Marines uh, uh, only and the Marines and Navy to do. So they added on Task Force 123, which was the Jesotif. Sh- this was really the first big airfield seizure uh, done by the Rangers. Mm-hmm. And it was big. It was huge. But what was really wild about it is nobody knew ahead of time what kind of resistance we were going uh, we to take. The initial idea was, well, they're not really going to do anything. We're going to land on Points Leeds Airport, and we're going to open up and gather up our our medical students we're going to fly out of there uh well that was a mistake because uh, they had they meaning uh cord and general austin who was in charge of uh of the grenadian uh forces there that uh he had all kinds of anti-aircraft guns all kinds of arms it turns out later on that there was like enough uh weapons on that uh on that island to give everybody on the whole island a gun and then some. So it was heavily armed island and standard Intel did not detect the anti-aircraft guns. Uh, They said, we suspect there's some here, but they're covered with tarps. We're not really sure what they are. All right, well, we'll we'll air land and go do it. Contingent Rangers, uh, they had a a C-130 formation, fly down there. Very first airplane comes overhead, has nav problems pulls off target, says it went back and restacked. And by the time they had restacked, the sun was already coming up. Says, uh, and Hobson was the pilot. And then he was Lieutenant Colonel, the eighth commander. Says, all right, was born in there and uh, gets about just prior to uh, over the threshold of the runway, gets a spotlight put on them. And all of a sudden they start opening up at an aircraft gun. It's 23 millimeter ZU-23 twos and uh, just started hosing them down. The other airplanes in formation broke out of formation, said, holy cow. Well, trouble is, Hobson was already committed because the doors were open and troopers are already exiting the airplane. Right. And as you guys know, that's not exactly a time when you want your pilot to do maneuvers. Mm -hmm. So he stuck with it, ran through the minute the last trooper uh, exited the airplane. He dove down to the deck and out over the water. And the very next thing there says, call in the gunships. Well, we had uh, two gunships overhead at that time. It was uh, Kuvion was the the first one who actually came overhead at three o'clock in the morning and called out the runway being blocked. 
So they, that's when we changed it from air land to air drop. Weren't really ready for air drop, but say the re-rig in flight to make it that way, which also slowed things down. So they brought in the gunships and uh, Clem Twyford was the other crew, Lima uh, five, uh, five, seven, oh, five, eight, excuse me. Lima five, eight came in and for 40 minutes, they started shooting these guns one by one. There were some 50 cals done in the airfield. They started there uh, and uh, they really started firing before they had clearance to fire. And Jim Roper, uh, who retired as a colonel, uh, was the air liaison officer there in Big Ike, Eisenbarth. You guys might know Big Ike. Uh, he was the uh, Ranger FSO. And guess what happened? That first airplane that dropped, who did they drop? The headquarters element. Yeah. That's it. One, I think one squad of Rangers, and that was it. Uh, the rest of them were all the headquarters guys. Now, here they are out in the open airfield taking fire from the hills, from this trench line up north. <laughs> it's like all hell's breaking loose. So uh, about the same time that uh, that clearance was given to fire, uh, Clem Twyford was already firing on the guns. And they just went for about 40 minutes, just gun after gun after gun. They had a malfunction, had to pull off. Uh, then uh, Kuvion came on after that, started firing at the guns. And that's where Hank's, um, uh, Hank Collins, Dr. Collins comes in. He lived in one of those houses right next to the airport. And he sent me the audio that he took that morning of the 40. And I could tell just by my experience and hearing gunfire from uh, the gunship on the ground, they were just coming right at him. And there was some that were coming right over the top of his head uh, next to his house, he says, yeah, the gun was like really close to me and the gunship was firing on the gun and you could actually hear the sonic crack of the projectiles coming over the top of his house before they're hitting. He says, those guys hit the skids. Uh, the, the ones that weren't taken out on the guns just hauled ass and got out of there over the ridge line. So about 40 minutes later uh, that uh, they resumed the airdrop when they were satisfied the majority of the guns, uh, the anti-aircraft guns were suppressed. And then they continued the airdrop and then into air land a little bit later, brought in the gun chiefs and so forth. Standard Ranger stuff as far as airfield seizures go. Uh, and that's when uh, ALF Company started making their run up uh, Gold Hill, what they called it, and uh, taking uh, the resistance out all the way up into the Cuban camp. Later on that evening uh, or that afternoon, the 82nd uh, Ready Brigade showed up and the 82nd got in on it, too. And they, they were a big part of the operation after that. But uh, uh, my crew, uh, <laughs> a personal story, uh, we were in Panama, actually, when day one occurred. And we got alerted. We're getting ready to fly a mission over El Salvador. And they said, you guys aren't flying El Salvador tonight? We want you to go to Grenada. Where the hell is Grenada? Never even heard of it before. And I, I think that I can share that with just about everybody. He says, Grenada? Yeah, it's completely off the map. It's so far out there, like 1,500 miles from Key West. Okay, where's Grenada? All right, well, why are we going there? Well, because, you know, they're doing a military operation there, blah, blah, blah. You know, back then, all we had was AFN down there in Panama. So really, uh, other than Intel, that's all we knew. So, all right, well, great. So my aircraft commander was a captain named Tarpley, and he says, okay, load it up. Let's go. So crew chiefs go out there, getting the airplane ready. Well, guess what? Our INS is broke, internal navigation system, or inertial navigation system. It's broke. He was not going to miss this one for nothing. He says, I don't care. Nav, shoot Celestial all the way up there. So we did. Celestial Nav, was, uh, I won't say the Nav's name, but he was later a pilot, but uh, just for privacy reasons, he's a good guy. But, okay, we're shooting Celestial Nav from Panama to Grenada. In the middle of the night, we roll in about midnight or so, something like that. And uh, <laughs> what's really wild about it is um, we're orbiting an island, and it's dark down there. And... He says, we're, the NAV says, we're, we're on target right now. And we could hear on the radio because all the secure comms were down. We're broadcasting in the clear. And so 
we're we're talking to the controlling agency, the talk over at uh, Point Salines. But we're 23 miles away on this island called Karakou, and we're orbiting that. And they're talking to the airplane that's over the seals that were under siege at Governor's Mansion, and they think we're them and them us. So now we're being directed to you can fire on any vehicle that's approaching the mansion. We're like, there ain't nothing here. <laughs> so finally, here's this vehicle rolling down the road. It's like a station wagon. Tarpley says, oh, there's a vehicle. Okay, arm the guns. Well, uh, we're not really sure about this. And finally, the FOCO says, no, we're not firing. So he pulls down the inhibits, says, something ain't right here. He says, Nav, where are we at? Well, I think we're in the right place, but I'm not really sure. All right. Then all of a sudden the right scanner pops up and he says, hey, guys, I don't know about this place, but there's a lot of shit going on on that island next door. <laughs> oh, save the guns. Oh, I'm unlo- I was on the 40. I'm unloading the gun and everything else. We had bicycles all in the back. It was like a tourist, like a like a <laughs> gypsy wagon because we had all of our personal goods from Panama. So I'm like, this is just a bizarre situation. We landed. I said, OK. All right. Uh, that was it for our our first mission there. We we didn't uh, we didn't fly again till the next night, and when we did, uh, the Rangers had just finished the Grand Ads uh, Campus rescue, and there, that's where, uh, believe it or not, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf was uh, was there. He was like second in command under Metcalf. A lot of people are not aware of that. Storm and Norman was in Grenada. And so he directed the Navy and the Marine Corps to deliver Rangers, if you can believe that, and made it work. Uh, so Ranger, uh, Rangers were delivered to the Grand Anch campus, which is on the other side of the island, by uh, the Navy, CH-46s and 53s. 53s pulled them out, 46s put them in. Uh, so while they were landing, uh, 46. One of them, uh, it was very narrow landing zone. They landed right on the beach. Uh, the tail, uh, 50 or 46, actually hit a palm tree with his rear uh, rotor. That's a, a Gallagher. A uh, good guy. He's since passed away, but I had some good conversations with him. Says, Yeah, we hit the tree. We had to abandon the airplane. So they left it on the beach. Uh, the Rangers that were there that were still there when the other forces were extracted along with the uh, students. Uh, they uh, got the life raft out of the helicopter, start paddling out to sea. And that's about the time where we're called to show up and destroy that helicopter. All right. Got to destroy the helicopter. That's what they said. So we go rolling up there and mind you, our, our gun was malfunctioning, our 105. That's what we're going to shoot a helicopter with, the 105. And uh, the firing solar nose broke. It was broke the day prior, but that's what we had to go with. So we had rigged up a lanyard to pull. So not exactly the most accurate method of fire, because now we got the pilot who's actually aiming the gun, and the gun is being tracked, or the target's being tracked by the sensor operator. So the gun's moving, and then the gunner is firing it manually. So you got three guys that all got to do things in unison here in order to get a hit. So what we didn't know, and I didn't find out for over 30 years, and I found out on the actually the Grenada Facebook page where Dr. Robert Jordan says, here's the helicopter I was on when Spooky tried to kill me. <laughs> what? So I said, could you please explain? He says, yeah, me and uh, in some local Grenadians and this, this lady were all on the airplane along with this pregnant dog. You can't make this shit up. You really can't. <laughs> and we we're on there looking at it because everything was quiet by that point. And we were looking at the helicopter, and all of a sudden we heard this loud boom. And then we got off the helicopter real quick and went into the Spice Island Inn and hid in the uh, the walking cooler. Well, I said, wow, this is amazing because, you know, I was on that crew, and I can tell you the first round we missed it by like 50 meters. And we hit this beach shack and just blew it to pieces, 105 HE. And and I said, yeah, we missed it. And as a matter of fact, we didn't hit that helicopter with a 105 or a 40 one single time. We did hit it directly with 20 millimeter later on, but it looked like Swiss cheese and we were done. And that there's a picture of it up on the Internet. And 
uh, I said, wow, if that fire control system would have been up and running properly, we would have hit that helicopter with the first round of 105, and everybody in there would have been a casualty. Uh, and I told them, you know, I've had a couple of Zoom calls with them and everything, or at least one, and talked to them off online. And I said, you know, I was kind of joking with them. I said, you know, Dr. Jordan, I'm sure glad we didn't kill you that night because you're really a nice guy. And uh, he says, yeah, I, I agree with that. But, you know, if there was ever any one time that having a defective yeah. weapon yeah. came to our advantage, that would have been it. Because just a bizarre story. And I, I would have never known that had I not been doing the, the research. Was that but, the 105 uh, that was rigged with the shoestring? Uh, that was uh, Ron Broyles and the first crew. We actually took one of the seat cables because okay. you know, they had a little T-handle on, and we rigged it with that. But, yeah, it was pretty much the same way, old, old school, arty kind of uh, application, pull the lanyard. But, uh, wow, it's just, like, pretty pretty wild. It was, um, But, really, you know, my crew after that, you know, we had a couple of calls from fire with the 82nd, like on day three. But by day four, or so things were pretty much uh, pretty much done. Uh, but uh, and the whole airfield was uh, controlled by the Rangers at that time. The extraction airfield, uh, Point Salines or Salinas, depends on uh, on how you pronounce it. So yeah, uh, Grenada uh, was one of those uh, successes that, uh, like I said earlier, the only reason why it's a success is because of the the grunts, the airmen. Uh, the, the squids, you know, everybody on the ground because command and control really didn't do it. I, I would say General <laughs> Schultes did okay with one, two, three, uh, but uh, Major, or I mean, uh, General or Admiral Metcalf, uh, it was way beyond, in my opinion, it was way beyond his uh, capabilities as, as uh, controlling that operation. There was a lot of uh, urinary Olympics of all pissing contests with the, with the command and control. Yeah, you mentioned when you were first leading into it how bad the tactical planning was. Not not how bad it was, but how, you know, everybody was trying, nobody's passing along the plans. People, planners would have to go off base to use pay phones because they didn't have enough, like, secure lines. Was it like the story that, like, the only map they had for Grenada was, like, you know, a, a like, a tourist map or something like that from a gas station? Uh, that's that's partially true. Yes. Uh, not really absolutely true because uh, a couple of our crews had these giant maps that were one kilometer off on their like the whole island was not that big to begin with. But they had this giant map like like wallpaper for the north half. And then the, the southern half was another sheet. So it's like, wow, how are you going to how are you going to use that in the airplane? So there's a couple of guys that had that, and you know when well, Big Ike Eisenbarth, uh, the uh, the FSO for uh, for 175, he says he was calling the north half, the blue half, and the or uh, and the south half, the gray half. Get it? Uh, but uh, it really didn't match up all that well. So, but by and large, all the people on the ground had tourist maps or really these old British maps, because remember, Grenada was a British colony, and these maps, not a single one of them showed the Point Salinas uh, airfield, not a single one. And some of them even had a pencil drawing, like, here's your objective. <laughs> what? This pencil drawing right here? You sure? Is that the scale? So, yeah. Like a little arrow have... pointing north. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is north. <laughs> So, yeah, it was, uh, and, you know, part of that is because nobody ever took that part of the world seriously uh, as far as a military uh, operation goes. But uh, some of the things that uh, the folklore that's come out of Grenada, and part of it is because the media was not trusted at that time. you got to remember, we just finished Vietnam, and we had guys like Walter Cronkite and all that stuff that were always constantly sniping the military. So Reagan uh, says, now, I I don't want the media there because they're in danger. What In reality, I think nobody wanted them there because they didn't want them to be sniping at us mm -hmm. uh, on the news media. So whatever the case, I can't say, but I knew they weren't there. So a lot of that stuff, the, the media never really covered anything. So that made it folklore city. 
So one of the items of folklore that uh, uh, a friend of mine who's a Marine gunnery sergeant named Joe Muccia, uh, one of the best military historians you, you will ever find. Joe is like, it's his life. It really is. And he's good at it. We talked about the phone call. Now, uh, they made a couple of really cheesy or at least one really cheesy movie about Grenada Operation uh, Heartbreak Ridge. It might be a really good um, entertainment movie, but it's so far off from what really happened. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's laughable. So there's a scene in there where uh, this they make a phone call out to their headquarters and it brings in a helicopter gunship and so forth. And people ask me that. There's also on the internet, there's some uh, stories about, hey, you know, they are supposed to be legitimate, like, oh, well, the Army Rangers were pinned down and they called back to Fort Bragg and had an AC-130 sent for fire support on a phone credit card. Well, okay, uh, that in itself is false. Oh, was there a phone call made? Yes, there was a phone call made, but it was not with a credit card and it wasn't back to the headquarters. Uh, I I'm 99.9% .9 certain of this, but the guys that actually did it, they're not talking. And, and if you know, Duke Leonard, you'll know Duke don't talk. He was the seal that was in charge at the governor's mansion. How this all happened is, and I'll truncate it down. The uh, seals were supposed to take the governor's mansion and secure the governor general who was, actually being held prisoner along with his staff there. All right. So they were doing their infill. And when they did, uh, only the one helicopter that infilled uh, was, did it back on the tennis courts. Okay. They're okay. But uh, Captain Gormley, who was in charge of that uh, platoon, uh, he was, his helicopter got all shot up. So they had to withdraw. Well, SEALs that, that were uh, deployed, forgot the radio on the airplane, which is bad. You know, it was secure calm, but they left the radio on the airplane. So the only thing they had was their intra team radios. All right. Gormley goes back out to the aircraft or to the USS Guam, I believe, lands, hitches a ride back to the talk where Big Ike is and everything down in the airport. And the only way he could talk to his guys up there at the governor's mansion under siege was on those inter-team radios. So he gets up on high ground back behind the airport, and he's trying to talk to Duke and these guys, and Danny Chalker was there too, trying to talk to him really kind of low, low key, couldn't, couldn't hear too well. So that's where they communicated and said, hey, call the airport, this number right here, or what, I don't know which way it went, like if they called or Gormley called, but they made connection with the Grenadian phone system, not a credit card call back to brag and all this other stuff. And that's when they sent in Dave Sims, Lima 57. Dave Sims had uh, got there a little bit late because you know, the first time he took off, his airplane caught on fire. And most people think that's a bad thing. So they landed took another airplane. So they were about two hours uh, late getting to the island, which actually kind of worked out well for them because now they supported the uh, SEALs that were under siege and uh, fired on the, uh, the uh, PRA troops that were advancing, keeping them away. And from that point on, every crew, and that's about the time I described earlier, we were showing up. Uh, I think it was... Uh, I can't remember which crew was on at that time, but guys continually had uh, coverage over the uh, over the uh, house or over the governor's mansion while the SEALs were there. And the next morning is actually when the Marines rolled in there with armor and uh, and broke the siege, pulled the SEALs out. So uh, it's it's kind of a really neat uh, folklore story. But like I say, uh, it's. It's turned into something that it wasn't. Well, truth is stranger than fiction, too, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Bill, you're. But that's. You're, oh, please go ahead. Oh, that's something that Joel and I have been fighting for years. And as a matter of fact, you know, I I had to talk. Duke, like I said, Duke uh, Wellington there, yeah, or Duke Leonard Wellington is his first name. Uh, he don't talk. Yeah, but uh, a buddy of mine that I worked with it was an ST six guy too, and I said, hey. 
can you ask him? He goes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. So he did. He called him and he, he calls me the next day. He says, yeah, Duke ain't talking. And that's fair because Duke comes from the old school seals. You know, I signed this paper, piece of paper saying I won't talk about it and I won't talk about it. And that's fair. So, uh, but like I say, I think I'm 99.9% positive that, that there was no call made with a credit card to brag. Doesn't make any sense. Bill, you're kind of downplaying it a little bit, but you know, when we talk about the success of the ground forces in Grenada, like uh, most of that would not have happened if the AC 130s had not been there. I mean, you guys really turned the tide. Those, you know, the, the, the jumpers on the airfield or the, at least the second and third stick, uh, the governor's man. I mean, all these places, cheers, all these places like AC showed up and completely shifted the, the, the battle. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that, David. I, I agree with you. And we've talked about that, especially with uh, uh, Clem Twyford's crew. Uh, most of his crew are still around. Uh, Clem passed away a few years ago. But uh, had it not been for him and, and Kubion, had there been no gunships there, let's just say that, uh, that it was just like anticipated to be a air land, load them up and go out. It, they would have been decimated mm -hmm. had they had they not had air support. Now, granted, they did have the Navy there with A sevens, and uh, that was uh, uh, that was not the right airplane for that mission. Mm -hmm. yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, a friend of mine who I keep I hate to keep on saying it since passed away too. Harry Shaw lost both of his legs when the A sevens bombed the uh, the eighty second talk. Uh, in uh, Harry, Harry died last year of uh, COVID, believe it or not. So, but uh, yeah, it was, I, I think that the gunships played a key role in that. Uh, the, the Marine Corps helicopters did too, uh, not to the same level the AC-130 did, but uh, it was, it was I, I agree, it was definitely a, a part of the operation that would have been a lot more difficult without the airplane. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you talk about the A-7, like, a fast mover, it, it just, it can do a lot. And, and there are very specific, you know, there's certain circumstances where, where it's great, but it can't do that same type of troop suppression uh, that, that the AC can do. Yeah. Because, you know, the big thing is like, I, like I pointed out earlier on about the, the tenants of the gunship, uh, the ability to stay overhead, surveil, mm -hmm. pick and choose, fire at the right time. That's something that no fighter can do because, their nose on, uh, what we call the pointy nose, they go and they fire and then they're gone or reacquire and fire uh, uh, and reacquire where, uh, you know, the helicopters. And then later on, of course, they had uh, arty support too, mm -hmm. which is a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about the, the AC 130s and their, uh, their criticality in the opening hours of, uh, of that operation. That, that was really the key. I, I think the operation wouldn't have went the way it did without uh, that gunship support right from the get-go. Yeah. It reminds me of a quote that you had in your book that was that said, uh, when you don't need a gunship, anything will do. When you do need a gunship, o only a gunship works. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And we've You'll used that quote have plenty of times. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so after Urgent Fury... How, were things changing with the AC-130 with, <clears throat> with like the production? Because uh, you guys, you guys had a lot of weapons malfunctions during Grenada. Like there were a lot of mm -hmm. issues. Was there, in, were there efforts to modernize the uh, the AC-130? Yeah, we we did start with. Uh, it, it's a little bit after Grenada, uh, 85, 86 time frame. About the time that uh, SOCOM stood up in '87. Uh, with what we call the Special Operations Improvement uh, SOFI gunship, which we updated because, you know, the we had a lot of computer problems because everything that we had for the Grenada op was Vietnam era vintage. There was mm -hmm. nothing, really no upgrades. Uh, we took extra computers along sometimes and they, they just never really worked right. So as old school uh, pilots were were uh, essentially Kentucky windage. Mm -hmm. You know, our altitudes back then were typically uh, 6,000 feet, uh, 5,000 feet, 
uh, you know, in that realm. So you could really kind of fudge it. And then the, the CEP of the guns at 20 millimeters were, were rather large anyway. So you could, you could make up for some of it. But as our altitudes kept on climbing up to 10, mm -hmm. uh, which become our base altitude after a while, uh, my God, I mean, you couldn't, you had a lot of difficulty hitting targets. Mm -hmm. So upgrade of the computer, uh, somewhat of the ammunition to work some of those programs, but the guns rel stayed relatively the same. Uh, but the avionics did uh, improve. Uh, really, our last um, Vietnam era gunship wasn't upgraded uh, because it was shot down in 91. But all the other ones, the very first one that was upgraded was actually upgraded and delivered in uh, 1990. Uh, five six eight. So after that, there was a lot of improvements, but it was just a, a I wouldn't say a bloodletting session. It was just a hard row to hoe. Yeah, yeah. You know, you talk about flying at seven thousand feet. You're a, a slow moving aircraft that's orbiting the target. It puts the fear of God in the enemy for sure. But you guys are also a target at at that kind of low altitude and at the speed you move, right? Like it's a dangerous position to be in a lot of times. Uh, yeah, it, it can be. You know, we we have uh, uh, we've trained our guys for defensive tactics, and thank thankfully uh, the Vietnam era guys really played in on that. And that's uh, optical AAA was really not even a challenge uh, at that point. Uh, what we really had to worry about is man portable air defense missiles, SA sevens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the higher elements of fourteen, sixteen, and so forth. And uh, the aircraft were modified with uh, flare uh, decoy systems and uh, some level of chaff, but you don't want to take an AC-130 or any C-130 for that matter into a radar threat environment because mm -hmm. that's just like begging to get shot down. And uh, that did happen a little bit later in Desert Storm, which is a different talk, but, uh, but generally... Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I don't think it's really, I never really looked at it at, at that as that hazardous. I always looked at the helicopter guys for needing a wheelbarrow to carry their balls, especially those 160 guys, because these guys are right down there in it. And of course we lost, uh, uh, we lost some guys, some 160 guy uh, there, uh, uh, Keith in, in, in the Grenada took a direct hit when they were doing uh, the D boy raid on the Richmond Hill prison. Uh, and I think almost all those 160 helicopters got shot like Swiss cheese uh, in that raid was aborted. So uh, the AC-130 at 7,000 uh, feet, 5,000 to 7,000, we'll say in that range, that pretty hard to hit for optical AAA, but pretty easy to hit with uh, with a IR guided missile. And uh, we've got a defensive uh, suite on board, too, that we can tell if somebody's tracking us at radar. But uh, you'll be leaving with a seat cushion stuck to your butt after that. <laughs> um, so after Urgent Fury, uh, in the book, you talk about uh, Elaborate Maze, Nimrod Dancer, Blue, uh, Blue Spoon, which are all I mean, it's all fascinating. Like I I did not know how much the AC-130 had been used almost on a consistent basis during those years. Um, can we sort of jump ahead to just cause? Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah. And, and just to caveat on what you're saying there too, what people don't realize they say, well, I've had guys say to me before, like, Oh, just cause that was a quick in and out for you guys. Right? <laughs> no, we were there from 1983 on to 1990. And it was like a home away from all. I've been TDY, temporary duty, to Panama 25 times in that time span because we we're flying that mission to El Salvador from Howard. So, you know, people down there were asking me, like, hey, man, where you been? I said, I was back in my home station. Oh, we thought you were stationed here. So, <laughs> no. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that occurred prior to Just Cause that was Noriega, like, tweaking our – our earlobes saying, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, incursions in the Erhan tank farm, uh, Rodman ASPs. We're all down there pulling that security mission from about uh, 80, late 87, early 88 on uh, through Just Cause. So uh, Just Cause was 
by and large, I mean, the, the largest operation I was ever involved in. We had nine AC-130s, seven H models, and two reserve A models that, uh, that had specific missions down there. I mean, uh, people say to, to this day, well, how, how come Just Cause went so well? Well, we had plenty of practice, that's for sure. We, the gunships, were there. Uh, we had, we're in the country, in the target country, training up all the time. We're facing the PDF, the Panama Defense Force, on a regular basis. And they were all this, this they were playing chess and we were playing checkers. And we we're punching them in the face every chance we got. And we had our technology, but technology only goes so far. So uh, finally, uh, you know, and you can, people that are interested in all that pre-Just pre, uh, Cause stuff certainly can read that in the story. It's fascinating to me and uh, made a lot of really good connections uh, with uh, people that were involved in it as well from other services, uh, including the Army, SF. Well, just Cause uh, was really kind of one of these things that fell into our lap. If if there was a 1980s uh, I really effed up award, it should go to Noriega because here it was. We had just finished the Mod 4 exercise, and the Mod 4 exercise was a full-scale dress rehearsal for what was called Blue Spoon which is a wacky name they gave it prior to changing it to Just Cause. Blue Spoon. Okay. Because uh, then Red Spoon, it would have been Dairy Queen, right? But Blue Spoon. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, here we are. We had just finished up that exercise in early December, like I think around a 10th or 11th, something like that. Anyway, in that exercise, we did a full scale all the targets we're going to take down, everything, the whole plan was, was wrung out real time. We had the D-Boys do the train up for the Kurt Muse rescue. We built an entire top floor or two floors of the Modelo prison out on field seven here on Eglin. And the D-Boys is uh, Kelly Venon gave me a lot of really good information. You guys probably know Kelly, one of the most solid guys you're ever going to run into. They did that over and over and over again. I found cutoff padlocks in there and everything else. I mean, they were trained real well for that rescue. But even they didn't think it was going to happen until it did. So we're, the whole exercise was complete. It was on the shelf, ready to go. And we thought, well, okay, we're taking Christmas leave. We'll probably do another one of these next spring. And lo and behold, uh, Noriega's, some of his... Uh, some of his goons down there shot that lieutenant and captured uh, a, a Navy, I think it was Navy, and, uh, and his wife in, in prison and tortured them and, you know, really some bad stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And that's when, uh, when President Bush says, all right, go. <laughs> oh, shit. And they changed the name at that point to Just Cause instead of Blue Spoon because it just sounded uh, better, I yeah. guess. And uh, and I would tend to agree. So we then my crew, uh, we had two crews down there already and the reserve A models that were flying the security missions. The two crews, the H model crews were there to support the D boys on the uh, Muse rescue. Uh, they were like SCI clamp tight. You know, they didn't even let us know they were going that kind of thing. And uh, then we, uh, my objective was uh, real hot airfield support uh, uh, one, uh, 175, yeah, 175 and uh, one, I think one part of 375, they went north. So anyway, oh, wait, uh, 275, I said 175. Yeah, the guys from Washington, that's who we supported. Okay, sorry, Air Force guy talking. So, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, we flew down there, five ship formation, straight out of Herbert, went right into combat ops. Uh, air fuel all the way down there. We hit uh, the tanker. We we're fat as hell, too. We were like, one of our airplanes took off at over 180,000 pounds, and you need a waiver over 155. So it gives you an idea how fat we were. And uh, my airplane was like about a 173 or something like that. We took off slow, six hour mission down there, six hour time, all timed out reached uh, all of our airplanes uh, through a great deal of pain, especially with weather, made it down there to our hold points, 
and we all executed at the same exact time on H hour. And, uh, you know, since I will relate to the uh, Rio Hato mission, that was really important for us because we're going to have 500 Rangers jump in there three minutes after we started doing prep fire. Yeah. And three minutes just wasn't enough. And we knew that, but that's what the plan said. So, and they were, they put way too much confidence in my estimation in the 117s dropping those two 2000 pounders. And uh, of course, you know, uh, there's a lot of controversy about the, uh, the 117s. Well, we were supposed to miss. I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah. Just, just go with that guys. Okay. Whatever. Uh, but they really didn't change anything because uh, there they had the Macho de Monte, which was Panamanian special forces. And those are the badass guys. They had the six mechanized infantry there, which was their uh, mechanized infantry. Say they had V-150s and P-300s, uh, Cadillac gauge, you know, stuff that we we sold them. So uh, those guys, the six guys, a lot of those just just hauled ass the minute we started shooting. But uh, uh, the Macho de Monte, they stuck around all night, and and we had some pretty ugly engagements. That since we're on the public here, I'm not going to really go into that, but. Uh, there was some pretty severe uh, activity after that. Uh, if they and they were, they were obstacles to the Rangers, and they stayed on board. They could have just well left as well. But uh, we had one last danger close with uh, with uh, Dave Haight at that time. He and if you know Dave, he's he was a lieutenant at the time, and called us in and uh, on a guy on a gun uh, behind the Macho de Monte barracks, and that was. I walked that area uh, in March uh, doing a BDA assessment. And I still found bone fragments. It was a pretty, pretty ugly wow. engagement. So uh, in any case, uh, the Rangers were able to move in. Uh, they, they, they had took a few casualties. Uh, Lou Alvaro was one of them that, that was shot in the head. And you know, Lou's story, uh, which goes beyond that, but um, he did survive and later on, uh, Something else happened to him, but in in any case, uh, it was a success. Uh, we stayed there till about 5 a.m. or so, supporting uh, uh, the Rangers, and then uh, we went. We finally landed. I think it was 17 and a half hour mission for us. Wow, we landed amazing. at in the morning. Uh, and what was really the worst part about it was is we didn't take enough water along. So about the last five hours, you know, I I, I think I was pissing orange. Uh, I think everybody was because we we're all dehydrated when we landed and because we're working hard up there. You know, the gunners on the AC-130 are the manual labor. You're up there. Uh, you're already in, even though we're at 5,500 feet, which I wouldn't, I would still classify that as thick air. It's still, you're up at altitude and, uh, and it's, uh, you dry out pretty quick. Yeah. So, but, but generally, uh, you know, I, I, I've been out to Rio Hato like four times since then. The most recent one, one of the most rewarding experiences I had was going down there for the 30th anniversary and meeting about 100 of those Rangers we supported that night, wow. including Dave Haight, uh, Spicy Nick. If you're watching, hey, Spicy Nick. Uh, you know, all these guys, you know, Spicy Nick and I got so damn drunk that I think we were, took us two days to sober up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the way we roll, as they say. So, uh, but it was really great because... We were down there, and what's not known is that entire base was bulldozed out, and it was uh, there's a resort there now called the Royal Decameron. So what do I do as a as a uh, as a gunship guy? I go and try and find all the targets we engage, and I think we engaged 13 targets that night. And so I'm finding, and I found the majority of them. And there was one. It was a uh, when I went there in, in uh, uh, initially, I was there right in December, right after Rangers left. And then I was there again in February and March of, uh, of 1990 and doing my assessment. And I saw this big tree. It was like a giant tree, like maybe 50, 60 year old tree. And uh, it was right next to a gun that we engaged. And uh, there was a little memorial for the guy that was, was on the gun at one time. And, uh, the tree was just riddled with fragments. I mean, because we probably shot about seven or eight 105 HE rounds at that gun, and frag goes everywhere. Yeah. And that tree was just peppered with 
frag spray, and I remembered seeing that. So here it is, 30 years later, I'm going down there, I'm saying, I wonder if that tree is still there, because I will be able to identify where that target was just by seeing that. You know, I actually picked up a cartridge case that was fired at us that was laying there on the ground when I was there back in, in uh, early in 1990, picked up a piece of 105 frag and a bullet that was knocked off a case. I'm like, how often does a guy have a, a fragment from a shell you shot at a target and a shell that somebody shot at you? That's kind of cool. Yeah. Kinda a neat collector's item. So, uh, you know, maybe only amuses for me, but uh, anyway, so I'm looking all over this compound uh, or this resort now looking for this tree. Where's this tree? Cause that's my landmark. And uh, I had found some of the other places already. I says, I searched all the way up and down that road. Couldn't find a tree at all. Shit. It must, it must've died. It must've fell over. So I saw uh, a couple of Rangers and their wives that were sitting in this bar in lobby number three of the Royal Cameron. I said, well, I'll go join those guys because I can't find this tree. I go walking in the lobby. As soon as I cleared into the lobby by the desk, there's that tree right there. Oh, they there. built around they, it? They built around it. And there was like these uh, like metal uh, geckos up in a tree and everything, like decorations. It was Christmas time. So they had this tree uh, that, you know, some really ugly stuff happened by this tree. 30 years prior to that, but it's, it's, it was almost surreal because it had Christmas decorations on it and everything else. There was a, there was a little girl rolling around on the floor in front of the, the lobby desk, exactly where that gun was, where that guy lost his life. And I'm like, this is just way too, yeah. too weird for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I thought it was, it was just like, wow, man. Uh, but Anyway, that was uh, that was my my trip to Rio Hato at, at the 30 year point. It was definitely worth going, you know, and I, I can say, you know, people say, well, hey, you know, it's kind of cruel what you guys did. No, they were doing their job. The PDF, we we're doing ours. Right. I think everybody can understand that. And I know you guys have probably been in the same position before. You, you can't feel bad about doing that. You really can't. It's just the job. Yeah, it's consensual, right? Everybody's out there because they're out there. I mean. They're all out there to kill the other person. Um, for our viewers who don't know, can you tell us the like the difference between what a 105, a 40 millimeter, like what the weapon systems are on an AC-130? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the uh, We'll start with the 20 millimeters first, and they, they stayed on the airplane until about 97. And that was the same gun that was on the fighter aircraft, a rotary cannon, Gatling gun, if you will. And on the gunship, they fired at a rate of 2,500 shots per minute. So not as fast as the fighters, but putting out a lot of bullets. And we carried 1,500 rounds per gun. So a lot of noise, a lot of flash. We fired only high explosive incendiary projectiles. And they made a lot of noise. And they made a lot of flash. And they made a lot of splash. Uh, then, uh, But that was more for course engagements, uh, you know, wider areas because it was about a six miller radian spread where the 40 millimeter uh, was about a one miller radian gun. And it fired a two pound projectile. It's the same one that you see in the World War II movies, uh, essentially. I mean, it's the same round, uh, the 40 millimeter gun that you see in all the movie reels. And uh, it fired a 1.96 pound projectile, not to be too exact, but uh, of HEI, uh, typically high explosive incendiary is what we fired. We carried uh, at that time 256 rounds in the, in the magazine. And then the 105 is an adapted uh, Army artillery piece that it's, it's an M102 in the Army. We use the 137 recoil mechanism. We carry 100 rounds, and we can fire. At that time, we fired either white phosphorus or high explosive. And typically, high explosive, white phosphorus was just like for marking and for specific effects. We did use them in Panama, but really not too much after that. Uh, and uh, we could, the guns, like I say, the gunners, that's their job is to feed those guns. And uh, the projectile or the 105 round weighs about 42 pounds, roughly, or excuse me. Uh, yeah, about 42 pounds, roughly. It depended on what fuse. So we'll just say 40 pounds. And uh, the 105 or the 40 millimeters, two pound projectile, 1.96. Uh, 
and uh, it weighs about five pounds per round so in the 20 millimeters belted so it's nothing magic about our guns uh it's all repurposed from other applications uh that's kind of really smart business in my mind because if you make something that only you have right it's a lot more difficult to support right now was the 105 was that an auto loader or did you guys have to load each round Oh, each round, yeah. Oh, my there's, gosh. There's, there's no, uh, you know, at altitude, when we eventually started going w above 10, uh, 10,000 AGL, that uh, the air gets a lot thinner up there. We're on the uh, oxygen, on nose hose, and, man, it really becomes burdensome and tiring to be firing those guns at altitude. But there's something you get used to. That's, yeah. You know, you get used to it like anything. But uh, yeah, that's it's it's the manual labor, a uh, lot of lot of physical labor for the uh, for the guns, especially the 105. That's the wild. 40 is loaded in in four round clips, and the, you can hold up to nine of the gun. You know, you're cheating one, sticking above the top, but uh, two clips, uh, four rounds per clip, and you just feed them as the gun fires. You just continually feed them, just like you see in the World War II reels. So when you said that, I, I believe you said it was your last mission, but when your mission was danger close, uh, what is like the danger close for 105? What is the danger close for 40 millimeter? Uh, it, it depends on uh, the target and what you got in between, but generally uh, danger close for the 105 in most cases is uh, 100 meters. So, you know, 100 to 150, we, we had when Dave Haight called us in, at, at least it was at that time, the numbers have changed since then. But uh, when Dave called us in and his FSO called us in, or his, uh, what actually an FSO, but his, uh, his fires guy called us in, we had a building between us. So they were uh, pretty much covered from that. We we're very careful as to fire our sensor operator fired into this open field, making sure that he was firing on the other side of the building. And so the building absorbed the frag. Uh, they were only maybe a uh, hundred meters from us at the time, uh -huh. uh, maybe a little bit less. They were at the front gate of the uh, Macho de Monte compound, and they were taking fire from inside the barracks. And that's when we fired behind the barracks because that's where they were coming from. They were using the barracks as a, sort of a defilade, uh, but everything kind of stopped after that, and uh, as as we wanted. Yeah, and. For those of you who might be civilians and not know, like danger close is when an, a unit is calling that in, that means the rounds are are very close to the unit calling it in, but it's like, we don't care. Right, right. It's like, uh, you know, in the uh, there's a JTCG uh, calculation that we have. Uh, anything outside of one, uh, ten, or anything inside a 10% chance of being incapacitated, killed, uh, or injured gravely, uh, that's danger close. Anything 10%. So what we call zero one PI mm -hmm. probability of in incapacitation. So uh, it's, it's really wild because our navigators are always checking the distance and we need permission to fire danger close from the ground force. Right. And they, they had no issue with it at all. And you see a lot of like in, in, in your, uh, your time in Afghanistan, I know there's a lot of, a lot of danger close calls in in Afghanistan, and the AC-130 is uh, the crews are well trained in that area. Yeah, no, it, it is. I mean, you know, there are times when you ha when that's the only option. Want to uh, yeah. yeah jump onto Iraq uh, Gulf War? Well, uh, actually, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, can we talk a little bit about Somalia? Because, yeah, sure. Because ACs were there under uh, under the UN, right? Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that, and then what happened during the operation? Yeah, the Uza. I will say personally, Somalia was a huge disappointment for us, uh, for most of us. I'll put it that way. Is uh, initially we were sent over there, and this is a. Uh, uh, the UN, uh, if you give them a chance, they'll screw up anything. It, it, that's just my opinion. I think I find a lot of people that would agree with that. So uh, we were called up in June of 1993, 
because of Boutros, Boutros Golly, mm -hmm. who's still fucking up my spell checker today uh, <laughs> when I was writing that book. But uh, in any case, uh, they wanted us to come over there and shoot IDEED's infrastructure. In other words, his weapons caches, his, his depot, his tank yard, and so forth. So we sent four airplanes over there and a contingent of maintainers and a contingent of air crews. And they did, uh, in a matter of days, about a week and a half, actually, shot up IDEED's infrastructure, the radio station, uh, his, uh, some of his storage depots, the cigarette factory, which is where his, uh, his main bivouac was for his troops, or if you want to call them troops. Uh, and, uh, and that was it. Sent us back, back to the state saying, all right, well, IDEED's going to give up now because that was the idea that uh, Boutros Ghali had. It was like, well, hey, IDEED is, is going to suffer this and he's going to give up. Oh, come on. Yeah, this guy's been at war for their entire lives. They're not giving up for nothing. So ID went underground and just continued like nothing ever happened. Okay. So that's when the idea came up to send a capture mission over there. And what everybody knows now is Gothic Serpent, Task Force Ranger. We trained up with uh, Task Force Ranger before it was called that. They Exercise, if I remember right, was called Crafty Caper. Uh, wow. Okay. So we uh, we trained up part of the uh, the JTF package, like we always do. 160th was there. Uh, the D-Boys were there. And uh, Third Bat Rangers were there. All right. Everything went fine. The plan was in the can, ready to go. And we get back over here. And now when General Hoare, H-O-A-R, uh, that he was the CENTCOM commander. And he says, I don't want the AC-130s to go because we're trying to de-escalate. And after all they did in June of screwing up that town, I don't want them to go back because we're going to escalate this. That was his mindset. Well, I, a lot of people would disagree with that uh, for the point that, the gunship is there to support the ground force, not to just tear everything right. up. And that was the idea they had. So uh, through a, a series of conversations, we sent D Doug Mick Mickna from DOS and uh, Dion Skagley, only the captain, up to, uh, up to uh, Bragg. And they briefed General Garrison. General Garrison agree agreed, says, you know what? We got to have the gunship there. She so goes down to General Hoare and says, Got to have the gunship there. And I talked, you know, briefly, but I, I did communicate with uh, General Garrison, and he just kind of threw up his hands on it. And he says, well, I had, I really had no choice. They said, either you, you don't take the gunships or you don't go. And they even offered us, say, well, if you want the gunships there, they're going to have to operate out of Mogadishu. Well, that's just like you might as well plan on losing a couple because then they're going to mortar them right away. Right. Uh, so we were left out. My crew was then deployed to, uh, to uh, Bosnia and uh, in September, and I'm over there flying that crazy-ass mission, uh, Deny Flight, which is something, in my opinion, gunships, we had little to offer, but we were there. And uh, I, it was early October, October 3rd. We're getting ready to fly that night, and Wally Kuha, one of our sensor operators, comes out of the command center and says, uh, pack it up, guys. Uh, we're we're going. We're leaving. We're going to Somalia tomorrow. Go back in a crew rest. What? What's going on in Somalia? Well, the Rangers are having some trouble. So we then got redeployed down to uh, Kenya because the closest we could get uh, wasn't really a good idea to land in the Moog at that point. So we're in Kenya. the The next night we flew our first mission up there met up with the, uh, the task force. They briefed us on what was going on. We landed, refueled, and uh, took off and did overhead surveillance, just kind of like, hey, we're back. Uh, the very next night, we flew another mission, and uh, two of our crews, and uh, it was, uh, I don't know who came up with the idea or the concept. I think it was uh, Garrison, but I can't be sure. Says, I want you guys to go up there and show a force because I want them to know that you're back. Mm -hmm. And we went up there. My crew fired on a road intersection 
if you know uh, George Han Geo, I know you guys know him, that uh, Geo was there too. He says, yeah, you know, when you guys start firing, these guys are diving out of the windows of the cigarette factory because we're firing right on this intersection, not too far from the cigarette factory. And we want them to know we're back. Mm -hmm. And our instructions were fire up to 25% of your combat load in five minutes. Oh, we're having a great time. <laughs> oh, we're just pounding them out. You I mean, just pounding them out. And we went to check fire or cease fire at that point. And uh, lo and behold, and another crew did it down by Radio Mogadishu, same same night. Uh, and I, I think that, I can't remember which crew that was. But in any case, two crews fired. The very next morning, IDs call for a ceasefire. Yeah, because, you know, he knew, he was smart enough to know that, hey, these guys damaged me last time. They're going to damage me again. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was, uh, how can I say? It was boring, mm -hmm. very boring. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we turned a lot of jet fuel into noise. It wasn't really, it was, a. Uh, you almost, almost needed an act of Congress in order to get cleared to fire, but it was the UN mm -hmm. and the UN, like I said, they're so lethargic. We had one crew that, that ran out of fuel and they never even got, and they had like three hours of fuel on board waiting for clearance to fire that never happened. Mm -hmm. Even though they had a identified target, it was a, technical vehicle which is you know we know how that got its name mm -hmm. but uh they had chased them all the way into a building they had seen them fire they had it on tape because everything we do is video recorded chased them in there asked them for clearance to fire denied 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 uh that was the end of the story they landed never shot them is by the time uh the end of that mission my crew came back right before christmas my wife was pretty happy about that uh, and uh, the crews that came over to replace us were there, supposed to be there riding it out until the end of March. And uh, and things got so uh, crazy, I guess is a good way of putting it. So uh, we didn't really feel like we we're offering much anymore. It's just like you're there. Rangers were already home. The task force was gone completely. 10th Mountain was there. 10th Mountain says, we like the sound of that gunship overhead. We feel secure. There's val validity to that, but I mean, it really, it really was taxing on our on our unit, and we wound up losing an airplane and eight guys mm -hmm. uh, on the 14th of March uh, in an accident because things just got so fast and loose that the wheels came off. Well, I guess bringing, that's a good way of putting it. Them bringing you guys in there though was sort of a day late and a dollar short, right? In the sense of. <laughs> You know, the idea that you operate like a B-2 bomber where, you know, it's, I don't want to say a B-2 is indiscriminate, but obviously it's, you know, it doesn't have the type of precision you guys have, that you are a, you are a close air support uh, function. Yeah. And, you know, I've used that exact term or the exact statement, a day late dollar short. I've used that in describing that. Now, the question comes up, and I, I, I talked to Dan Schilling, who was one of the combat controllers. I think he actually wrote a book on it, too, on Somalia, saying, and yeah, as a matter of fact, he's quoted in, in my book, too, is would the gunship uh, made a big difference in Somalia for in support of Task Force Ranger? And I guess we'll never know for absolute sure. Right. But what I can tell you from what I know from tactical events in the past I can't see how it wouldn't have been uh, uh, at, at least a factor that would have, especially when we're talking about the lost convoys, we were, we're looked down, we're see, and we're following, we're tracking, we can guide people in, we can see roadblocks. Uh, not necessarily is everything the gunship going to do or the advantage uh, firing guns. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of other things we do as well. And, uh, but uh, again, we'll never know that mm -hmm. because it didn't happen. Now, Bill, I, I sort of want to put the focus back on you for a moment because you, I don't want to get this wrong, you were, uh, you were inducted into the SOCOM Commando Hall of Honor, into the Air Commando Hall of Fame. Um, mm -hmm. If I can talk about you basically re reinventing the, 10, the 105, do you want to talk about how, how did you do that? Like, well, it's it, it's uh, I was one of the guys. I'll put it that way. 
uh, you know, the 40 millimeter too. I mean, we did all kinds of wacky stuff. Like for example, uh, what I said earlier about, well, when you only get, you're the only ones using something, it gets hard to support. I'll just use the 40 millimeter for example. Uh, here it is. We're running low on 40 millimeter guns and parts. The, uh, this is post 9-11, for example. Uh, they said, hey, uh, the Air Force gave us four C-130 uh, H models. Uh, says, build these in the gunships. They're slicks. They're just cargo airplanes. Build them in- we don't have the guns to do it. We don't have the equipment to do it. So we had to go out there, and they said, we need five guns. But these guns were made in World War II and up into the 50s. You know, I was made in the 50s, so I know how old <laughs> that is. So, so uh, yeah, my parents should have bought that extended warranty plan, though, but they didn't. <laughs> damn it. So anyway, uh, this was a uh, uh, General Webb was in the seat then, actually. Uh, if you remember, he's the guy that's in the bin Laden killing picture. He's he's the guy, the, the three star or two star at that point. But he is my old boss. So I go to him and I says, hey, I got I found a source for about 13 million dollars for the 40 millimeter parts over there in Greece, uh, the country, not the lubricant. And I said, all right. I can go get these. They're they're free to us because they're part of the Marshall Plan. We gave them to them. All we have to do is pay for the uh, shipping. He goes, well, get your passport. Go over there and get them. So, you know, I took good leadership there saying, well, oh, let's let somebody else take it. No, I'm going to send my guy that knows what he's doing over there and secure these parts and mark them, and we got them back. I was just one of the guys that was playing on that, but I was the guy to go. So... Uh, another thing, well, we needed gun uh, breech casings. So guys knew out at Nellis, they had all these target vehicles out there because the M42 Duster is where our guns came from originally, Army and aircraft system. So guys are, that are going out there on these exercises, hey, there's a whole bunch of these on the, on the uh, Nellis range. They look like they're in pretty good shape. They just got bad barrels. I said, shit, I got like 120 brand new barrels from Greece. I don't need barrels. I need gun casings. So me and uh, Rick Smith and I went out there and uh, got all kinds of clearances. Uh, some of these guns came off the uh, area near uh, Area uh, 52, is it? Or whatever it is area out there. Area 51. Uh, 51, there you go. Yeah. Area oh, yeah, 51. 51 right? For some reason, yeah, I thought 51. it was 52 too. Yeah. Yeah, 51. 51, 52, whatever it takes. And so, yeah, uh, so we pull these guns off, and then uh, there's a uh, one of the technicians that probably did more for us than anybody that I can recall. His name was, uh, he was a former EOD bomb tech uh, named Mac McClenahan, who was civil service uh, a technician at Eglin, gun technician. This guy was a genius when it comes down to uh, getting stuff done. And uh, we brought those breech casings back. And he put them over the machine shop and uh, Robert Hammock and all these guys, those guys worked them to the original plans. And we converted all these guns that uh, were supposed to cost $8 million. We did the whole project for $60,000. Wow. And we were, we were done. We, we complete NDI x-ray, brand new barrels, everything. And, uh, and we did that in six months time. So, that's the kind of stuff they look, you know, everybody does the combat stuff in the gunship world. I mean, I, I don't think that was really any big play in as far as getting either one of those awards. It's all the other stuff. Uh, like say I was uh, one of the point men on uh, the Moab, the uh, uh, manufacturer, the design of the Moab, because when I worked in weapons and tactics, I was the weapons and tactics superintendent. So I'm the one that started the whole thing with Eglin and uh, got uh, the Moab going. And of course, like I say, I was just a bit player. I'm the guy that started. I'm not the guy that finished it. There's there was 200 or 250 people that worked on the Moab project, but you got to start somewhere. So that's where that recognition and, and uh, I didn't even know I was being submitted for it, to be honest with you. Uh, I just know that the historian's office, who I guess that's one way of knowing you're old when the historian's <laughs> office is looking for 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 advice. Historian office calls me up and says, "Hey, Bill, I need your uh, I need your package, basically my my career uh, accomplishments, you know, that you use on your 
uh, EPRs, OERs, you know, your performance reports. I said, okay, what do you need it for? Can't tell you. So, okay, whatever. So I sent it to him and here about two, three weeks later, I get a call from Admiral Olson saying, hey, uh, Chief Walter, uh, want to let you know that you're being inducted into the Hall of Honor. I didn't even know what it was, uh, but it was, uh, it's cool. And what's cool about it is it's, I represent all the other guys that did all the work. Uh, you know, like I say, it's not a, it's not a me thing. It's a we thing. And I, I ask, actually, I'm not saying that just to say it. I actually believe that it's always a team effort. Uh, not, not just me. Well, I, we appreciate you and everybody else on these birds. I, these, the AC 130 is, is, it's, you know, when one of those shows up on station and you really need them, it's like the hand of God reaching down and slapping the bad guy and going, uh, 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 you guys, I mean, really, you guys are just heroes to, to everybody who's been on the ground. When your uh, squad sized formation gets lit up by the uh, IR light on the AC-130, it's just a big square yeah. coming down on yeah. you. You're like, oh, exactly. what's about to happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, honestly, yeah. 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 Even when you're trying to well, find I, out which house is the right one and they like yeah. point it out for you, you're like, hey, thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, that, that, uh, thanks for the compliments, guys. And I'm sure there will be other people because I know there's a lot of other gunship people on, on that are going to see this uh, podcast. And, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I've, I've worked with uh, Op4 too. I know exactly the feeling is like they're calling in. Uh, we abbreviate to a five line typically, you know, we don't even run the whole nine line cause we don't need it. But when, when the sensor operator, the low light level television hits you with the glint, yep. that beam you're talking about yep. right away, as you're calling in, you, you, you start sucking up a seat cushion right away. Yeah, it's like, yeah. uh, this is not, this is not the target. Oh no, we're offsetting. Okay. Well that makes you a, a little bit nervous too saying you're offsetting your ID in because, you know, our typical engagement is we always ID the friendly position first, yep. lock it down. So yep. We'll have one sensor looking at the friendly force, locking them down. Then they're measuring the distance to find out where we are. And then we're applying our no fire heading. It's actually quite, uh, quite technical. And then uh, before we fire, but if you don't know that and you say, this big ass light is on me yep. and they're saying they're, they're getting ready to fire. Are they going to shoot at me? Yeah. Uh, and they did have a few incidents uh, in Vietnam where they had uh, the early offset system where they actually accidentally fired on the, on the friendlies. And thankfully they missed. Uh, but uh, you know, anything technology can go South on you at any time. It's one of the things I always liked about the, H model gunship, which is the one I typically flew on, everything was a manual backup. We talked about the lanyard pulling the 105 before. Well, were we really 100% uh, capable? No. But were we capable to a certain extent? Yes. Uh, nowadays, everything is computer based. I mean, uh, you can't just shut it off and turn it back on again and, and make it work. So there's pros and cons, but, but then again, too, the systems of today are absolutely unbelievably accurate. Yeah. It's like way more than we ever dreamed about being back then. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, I guess you can say it's, you know, we're going to get cut either way. Well, I'm pretty sure AC 130s are like the prime suppliers of kill TV too, when you're back in the jock. <laughs> yeah Bill, yeah that's uh, right to, to start wrapping up here I, i'd really like to kind of hear because uh, i know you still have your hand in this world um what do you think about uh how the ac-130 as a platform has evolved since 9 11 and through the war on terror um what has it been like to see that evolution what have you seen what have you noted in some of the changes yeah that's a great question uh yeah and i am uh still involved in the, in the process now, 44 years. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, almost like I just said, it's like night and day compared to the airplane that I flew on and the airplane that we're building now and putting out to the field. It's, it's like, uh, absolutely. I, I feel nothing but intense sense of pride when I go to work and say, you know, 
these these young kids that are flying, and I say kids because I'm in my 60s, uh, they don't know how good they got it sometimes. It's like, wow, man, this. Oh, how did, uh, did we lose Bill? We lost audio on you, Bill. Bill, we lost audio on you. Uh, there we go. Okay. This false speaker has changed the headphones, so I think maybe the batteries in these okay. went out. But uh, if you can hear me okay, yeah. I'll go ahead and wrap Yeah, we got up. you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, they're these guys that are, and it's, it's men and women, both crewmen. Uh, we've reduced the crew size a lot. They're doing absolutely phenomenal work down range right now. Much of that never gets released to the public for security reasons. One day it will. And mm -hmm. I keep on getting a uh, ping from them because I know most of them. They say, when are you going to write a book about them? And I said, do you really think that I'm able to write a, uh, your name into a book about all these people that you smoked over in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're ready for that yet. And Dopser is not going to let me publish that. This is if I cannot do a, uh, a good comprehensive history, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to wait until the time that I can. Yeah. Cause it's not doing them any justice. If you do a half-assed job and uh, because of classification reasons. So uh, the evolution of the system, well, I'll put it this way. When I first started out in 78, like I said, when we opened up this, this, this uh, episode, they told me don't plan on staying here long because the gunship's going away. Mm -hmm. That was 44 years ago. We're still here, and we're just building brand-new models right now. Matter of fact, I got three of them coming out of the barn, the last three uh, here within the next uh, three months. So uh, are we here to stay? I don't know. I can't make that decision. But uh, are we uh, still effective in combat? Yes, absolutely. Uh, depends on a lot of things. But uh, the, the capabilities of the airplane now are uh, absolutely phenomenal. And I'm not saying that just because I work those programs. I'm saying I know the difference. It's like, wow, man, this is just, just unbelievable. I wish I could set my clock back and be a young guy again and go fly in the airplane. But I can't do that. Uh, you know, it's interesting because in an age where technology, smart bombs and these things are, you know, constantly in development, I, as a person on the ground, you can't think of anything better than an AC-130 or an A-10 coming come, come to your rescue. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're we're right there with the A-10s, too. I mean, they're, they're of course, the other redheaded stepchilds of the Air Force, too. Uh, we're accustomed to that. I mean, we're we're always uh, treated that way. But you know what? Duck off of water's back. It doesn't bother me one lick because we work for the DeSotif. That's what we do. Yeah. Bill, can you throw up your books again? Show them to our audience again. Uh, and people can go and pick them up on Amazon right now. So we got their links are down in the description if people want to check it out. Ghost Riders, 1968 to 1975. And the second volume, Ghost Riders, 1976 to up 1995. Yeah, uh, and, and I can speak to the second book. Like, e even if you're not kind of an Air Force, you know, a, a like aircraft person or think that it's going to be technical, it's a great book that tells the breadth of the story uh, and, uh, you know, of, of each individual event and really just how the AC 130s fit into that event. Um, it's a great primer on, on the history of all these events, though. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I it work, work a lot a lot of work and I worked real hard to get it right. And, and it is, I mean, I've had nothing but positive comments, not a single negative comment that I've received. There's about uh, probably about 1500 copies out and it's only released four months ago. So it's, it's, uh, it's really picking up a lot of interest. Well, hopefully we'll double that for you. Come on guys. Hook a brother <laughs> up. Hook a yeah, brother up. Hook a brother up. <laughs> uh, and and what, one thing I want to say before we go here, too, guys, I appreciate your service, too. I mean, we we have nothing but respect for Rangers, SF as well, uh, and especially the D-Boys. I mean, of all the people I like to work with, they were tops. And, I gotta, of course, I've got to give our obligatory shout-out to the SEALs. Yeah, got to, got to do that. <laughs> yeah, I thank know you, there's, Bill. One yeah, team, one yeah, fight. Yeah, we feel you. We feel <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, because you were a diver too, right? <laughs> I was a diver. I was yeah. a diver. Uh, 
We got two. We got a couple questions real quick. KT, Jack, please elaborate on KB, KGB infiltration of Eagle Claw and ask the guest if he noticed or heard anything like that. Uh, infiltration of Eagle Claw. I mean, go go read Ron Lenahan's book, Crippled Eagle, or Charlie Beckwith's uh, memoir called Delta Force. Check out either of those. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have no knowledge of that. Uh, and I can say... Um, there's another one too. Uh, Keith Nightingale has one out too. Yes. Uh, on the on the background of that too. Uh, Phoenix Rising. All right. And then Izzy, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. I've been uh, supported. Oh, I've been supported by AC130. Great insight. I thought AC meant air conditioning. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, yeah. it, it it could be depending on how many holes you put in them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I, I uh, dad joke Friday. I cannot imagine though, you guys flying. It's a slow moving aircraft. You know, it's a prop like the, what it must have been like for you guys to fly to all these conflicts in an AC 130, a non, uh, I, I can't even imagine what that was like for you guys. You know, I, I I thought about that often when when I was flying the line doing the mission. I just thought that's a normal way of life. I mean, this is all I knew. I mean, since I was I got in was 21 years old and just just kept on going. And I don't I didn't realize till way after when I had retired and everything uh, how special that job really was and how impactful it was. I just thought, well, hey, you know, this is what we do, and uh, it, it is unique. I mean, who else would put a bunch of damn guns on a C-130, go out there shagging ass and shooting shit? I mean, come on. Uh, it's not a normal thing. But to me, it was. Yeah, it's amazing. Hey, guys, please uh, buy the book. You will love it. I guarantee it. Fantastic. And check out uh, the links down in the description if you guys want to support the uh, channel. Make yep. sure you subscribe to it and like the show if you haven't already. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. And uh, we'll see you guys next Friday. Thanks, Rudy. All right. Uh, we Wait, good? Are we out? No, because your mouth is watering. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah, so join our Patreon, too, while we're at it. Uh, I'll you know. kill the stream on my end. Yeah. Good seeing you guys. We'll see you guys next Friday. Take care. Yeah. <laughs> Are we out? We are now.